coming today, and uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, John Duffy, physical therapist. Um, John is your proverbial hometown guy. He uh, literally came back to serve the community that, uh, that he grew up in. Uh, John and I have had an excellent working relationship for several years now. He, uh, he, he's employed by Phoenix Physical Therapy, and um, we, uh, we treat each other's patients, uh, I'd, I'd say, commonly. So uh, he's going to speak to you about why physical therapy is a viable choice for, uh, for your injuries. So please, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, a bit about me, I am a local guy. Grew up in Scott Township, actually right behind Mustin's Clinic, and uh, my mom still lives back there in Birdland. Uh, I graduated from Pitt in 1991 with my PT degree and worked at Allegheny General Hospital for a couple of years. And then I became director of South Hill Sports Medicine Clinic down on Vanadium Road until 2008 when I left to come for Phoenix. So during that period of time, I was running a large region. I opened up facilities in Bedford and Meadville and Altoona and hospital facilities. But I got three little kids now, so I've kind of cut back to just treating patients and doing what I love. So I've been up at Phoenix since 2008. And uh, I wanted to give everybody a good talk about 10 good reasons, and it was hard because there's probably 50 good reasons, um, as to why somebody should choose physical therapy for various things in their life. And it's a health fair, so it's, it's very appropriate to talk about it, but the fact that it's also for uh, suicide fundraising, and it ties into that, and I'll give a couple examples of that uh, as I go along. So, uh, number one, it's, it's physical therapy is actually direct access in Pennsylvania. It's been going on for about 10 years, meaning you can go to a physical therapist without having to see a physician first, unless you're Medicare, workers comp, or auto, which is, for me, only about 20% of the insurances that I take. So, you can come to the physical therapist. Uh, we can treat you for 30 days, and if we don't like what we see, we will send you to a physician to have things checked out. My first patient that I had direct access is a girl I had treated a bunch of times and she was going through a divorce and a lot of stress. She was running and running and running and just beating herself up and she had hip pain. I didn't like what I saw when I examined her so I sent her next door to the orthopedist. He came over about a half hour later with an x-ray and said, I'm here to show you something and he held it up and she had a crack in her hip. So he operated on her last night, that night, and put a couple pins in her so that she didn't fall and, and break her hip. Um, so we're trained to pick up a lot of that stuff. Most people don't realize that the physical therapists that graduating now are actually doctors of physical therapy, just as you'd have doctors of chiropractic and doctors of dental medicine or veterinary medicine. Um, so we're, we're trained to pick up that, uh, but we can see people for that 30 days. And like I said, if we don't like what we see or, or it's not a musculoskeletal problem or we're suspecting it's you know cancer or gallbladder or any one of those things, then we send a person over the, to the physician. Um, number two, there's numerous specialties in physical therapy. And I think we have an image problem because most people portray physical therapists as you know, the young guy with chinos on and a polo shirt walking a smiling old lady with a walker. And that's just constantly the image that's put out there. And I don't do that. And you know, maybe some of the hospital PTs do. Uh, but there's a lot of different aspects to it. And you know, there's orthopedics and sports medicine, which is what I personally do. Um, there's women's health. And they treat incontinence and pelvic pain and there's a lot of women out there, especially after childbirth, that suffer from incontinence and leakage. And it's treatable. And it's a, it's a shame because a lot of women will not exercise because of that. They don't want to go do an aerobics class because they don't want to dribble when they're jumping and bouncing around. But it's a very treatable condition. And the therapists that do it, I'm not one of them. I think that's, at least for that component, that's usually where they're more comfortable having a female therapist. They have great luck with that. And, and men suffer from incontinence too. And men, after they've had prostate surgery, suffering from you know, incontinence, you know, both ends. And that is all treatable as well. Uh, there's pediatrics. Um, they specialize in treating kids with you know, muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, things like that. It's, it's an aspect of the profession I could never even step into because it's so different than what I do on a daily basis. Uh, home physical therapists that go simply to people's houses and treat them, whether it's after a surgery and they need to have something done at home until they're able to get out of the house. And there are some people that are just homebound. And, and I think it gets neglected because you have people, they're elderly, they can't get out easily. And somebody can go to their house and improve their quality of life. And that's stuff that's covered by insurance as long as it's medically necessary and improvements can be made, but they usually can. So it's, it's a shame that some elderly people are stuck in their house 
and you know the next step is the nursing home because they can't get around their house on their own but it's it's fixable there's neurological therapists that treat spinal cord injuries and stroke patients and cardiology and pulmonary so there's a lot of different subspecialties um, number three this this is probably the the most important one uh, the reduction uh, and or the elimination of pain and it's in the news all the time right now there's a serious opioid epidemic in this country in 2012, they said enough prescriptions were written for opioid medications to give every adult in the United States a full bottle of pills. And that's bad. So they've realized now we've, we've got a problem on our hands. And, you know, five, six, seven years ago, they were just dishing the stuff out. Oxycontin, you know, you read about all this. And four out of five heroin addicts started on these prescription medications. And what happens is, is, you know, they have cracked down. Doctors count the pills when these people go back to pain management, you know, and give them crap, you know. You're not, you know, you're not supposed to be out at this point. You're supposed to have three left, and then they don't give them anymore. Well, it's a lot easier and cheaper to go out and get heroin than it is to get some of these prescriptions filled. And that's what they do, because at that point, they're hooked. And I had a younger lady, and everybody thinks that these people are junkies, you know, living under a bridge, but, you know, there may be somebody in this room addicted to opioids, and I'm sure you walked by somebody somewhere today that has a problem with it. it. It happens very quickly for some people. You know, they say heroin is addictive the first time you take it. Well, there are people that get their knee replaced, they go on the opioids, and they're hooked. Some people can get off it easy, some people can't. I got a guy right now, he's, he's suffering from constipation from it. He's had to go get two enemas done just from the pain medications. And I treated a girl last year, and her younger brother committed suicide and he was addicted to prescription pain medications. But he was a football player in high school and he suffered a concussion. And that's what they put him on. And, and it snowballed. And then he started doing other drugs and the life fell apart and he killed himself. He was like 21 or 22 years old. Um, so physical therapy has been shown and they're pushing this now, the American Medical Association and a lot of the other professions, is just as effective at treating chronic pain as the opioid medications are. Now I know when somebody has a rotator cuff repair, you gotta give them something because they're gonna be in a lot of pain. It's just this long-term, these people that come in and have long-term chronic pain, and they're just like, oh, here, take the Oxycontin. And that's, that's not gonna work because chronic pain, and I, I invite everybody, if you ever get a chance, go onto YouTube and punch in chronic pain explained in five minutes. It's one of those whiteboard drawings where they draw real quick and they explain it. And it's amazing. In five minutes, you'll have a really good understanding of what chronic pain is. Um, and what I try to do is educate people. And one of my favorite examples is, and it's probably happened to everybody in here, you know, you go to a movie and there's somebody sitting three, four rows behind you and they're whispering, whisper, 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 and it's all you can hear and it starts to drive you crazy because it's almost like all you can hear. That's why my wife won't go to movies with me because at that point I, I stand up and I tell people to shut up so she doesn't go to movies with me. But that same person, which is me, can then go and sit at the swimming pool and read a book while kids are screaming, splashing, and all that noise around him. And chronic pain can be like that. You know, you, you sprained your ankle, it's a year later, you're still having pain. Well, the tissue's healed, you know, that's all taken care of. Your brain is in this red alert mode now. It's constantly saying there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem, and it becomes almost an obsessive focus. And you have to get people to learn how to tune that out. And that's one of the things that we're trying very hard. Because you always hear the story about people with phantom limb pain. You know, they have pain in a foot that they don't even have. And Mr. Spock once said in Star Trek, you know, pain is a thing of the mind and the mind can be controlled. And there's a lot of truth to that. So check out that thing on YouTube, uh, Chronic Pain in Five Minutes. It's very interesting. Physical therapy can save people money. All right. Uh, they're showing now that if, if you have an MRI for a low back problem, before you go to physical therapy first, the costs are $4,000 to over $7,000 more than if you would have done PT or chiropractic as a conservative measure first. Because what happens is you have back pain, you go to your doctor, he sends you to a specialist, they do an MRI, they find things that are on there anyway that may not even be causing your pain, and then you're sent to another specialist, maybe for injections, medications are done. The next thing you know, the, the costs have ballooned. And with health insurance the way it is now, especially for me personally, I mean, the MRI is, that's out of my pocket. That's 1200 bucks I have to pay. And I'd much rather go do a month of physical therapy with a $20 copay per visit than dish out that money because you're going to dish out that money for the special tests and the medicine and all that stuff. And odds are they're going to say, ah, eh, go to PT. Well, you know, you should have done that first or chiropractic and get it resolved.
Um, there is a small percentage that we're not going to get better after that period of time. And in that case, then you go and you follow up with all the special stuff. Um, improving balance and reducing falls. And if you're a woman in your 80s and you fall and you break your hip, you have an 80 to 90 percent chance of dying from that injury, uh, just from the cascade of things that happens, you know, pneumonia, the deconditioning, the heart, all that. And falls cost society a lot of money. A lot of people lose their parents and loved ones over that. So that's one of my favorite things to treat. And that was one of my patients, and she'll tell you I've had my own mother up there. Uh, very hard I try to get somebody to bring her up three days a week because she has had some falls and how she has not broken her neck I not a clue but you know when I get her there on a consistent basis and we work on things because you know as we get older there's very predictable things that happen that affect our balance you know we get weaker our neurological reflexes are slower by the time we realize we're falling we can't react as quickly uh, we're stiff we're tight and uh, they're all fixable things. So that's the best part when you get people in there that are struggling to walk or they have to use a walk or they can't get up and down their steps and you can do all th these things and, and in a lot of instances hopefully save their life from having a problem down the road. Um, dizziness and vertigo, this, this one is interesting. Uh, I've done this before and Julie who I work with uh, really loves it and I think she's even better than me at it. Uh, there's a condition called BPPV, okay, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. and Inside our little ears, and we have these little semicircular canals, there are little gyroscopes that constantly are telling our brain where we are at in space at any given time. And we have these little otolith crystals in there that are really just limestone, you know, once you break it down chemically. And they can dislodge, bump in the head, an illness as you get older and things just start to fall apart. And one of those little stones can come out and it goes into one of those semicircular canals. And now it's providing inappropriate feedback as it touches the nerve receptors in there. Your eyes are seeing one thing, your gyroscope's saying another thing, and then next thing you know, you have a nasty case of bed spins. And I don't know if anybody in here has ever had it. Okay, so when people, it's, it's bad. I mean, you know, I drink too much and get the bed spins, I throw up and I'm okay for the night. But to have it for days and days. So the PT for that is, it's actually very interesting. I mean, all you're basically doing is examining the person to determine which side and which canal that stone is in, and it's just a matter of just positions of the head as you basically get it out of that canal and back into the utricle where it sits. Keep the person propped up, don't let them lay flat that night, and odds are that stone will kind of stick back in the little saccule that it's in, and, uh, and they're fine. So you see these people, and they've been miserable for a week or two weeks, and you do that, and they come back, and they're like, you know, thumbs up, I'm 90% better. Let's show them some exercises to do at home, and they're out the door. Uh, we improve function. Uh, we don't always have to treat people in pain and, you know, fall down steps and break legs or whatnot or post-surgery. There's a lot of people that have functional problems. They struggle to get out of a chair. They can't get up and down their steps. They can't reach overhead to get things out of the shelf. They can't turn their head good to drive. And those are all things that we can fix on people. So you don't have to sit there and say, well, I'm just getting old. I, you know, steps are going to be a struggle or I have to turn around like this while I drive. It doesn't have to be that way. They're all fixable things. And it doesn't n mean you have to go to therapy for months or anything like that. You go for a couple weeks and learn what to do yourself. Get a family member to, you know, to work on you. It, it's, it's not difficult. But it's a lot of fun when you improve something. You give somebody their neck motion back when they're 75 years old that they had when they were 40. They're happy. And then I'm happy. Um, improving overall health. I mean, PTs are the specialists in movement dysfunction. And you know, I would rather have somebody go to a, a good PT to learn exercise uh, than a professional trainer that went to two weekend courses. And this is what we're trained to do. And, and a lot of PTs forget that that's something. You know, again, you have to remind a lot of physical therapists that you don't have to see all these specific injuries. I mean, if somebody comes into you and just says, I want bigger guns, you know, you should be able to show them how to do that. I want bigger calves. You know, a middle-aged guy like me, wife's always making fun of me that I'm losing my bum. You know, it happens to guys when they get to be 50. You know? That's stuff that we can teach people how to do. I want better abs, I want stronger abs, any one of those things. I want more trunk or core strength to help my golf swing or my tennis swing. That's what we're specialized at. I mean, we've seven years of college to do that stuff. That's, and, and it's fun to do. So, you know, it's kind of neat to have the variation where you might have the stroke patient in that day, the little kid with a sprained ankle, and then somebody that just wants more power on his golf swing. I, I enjoy that. 
And then lastly, education. Um, I probably should have put this earlier up because this is very important. And I find that a lot of the success, at least that I have as a physical therapist, is simply educating people. And um, they're coming out with numerous studies now that are showing, and, and I'll show people this, they come in and they're all worked up. They did get that MRI first, or they got their x-rays first, and they have a bulging disc, or you know, stenosis, or arthritis, or any one of these conditions. So I have this little chart, and it's clipped by my desk, and I'll take it, and I'll sit down, and I'll show them. I'll say, well, here's age groups by 10 years, okay? I'm like, okay, so you're 70 years old. Well, 90% of 70-year-olds, you know, have bulging discs. You know, 93% have degenerated. You know, you go through all this stuff, and it kind of puts their mind at ease that, oh, okay, well, that's kind of normal. But then you have to tell them, okay, well, the thousands of people that they use this study for, they're all symptom-free, you know? So you've had all of these things that show up on the X-ray and the MRI for a long time, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily causing your pain. And that really changes people. So they're doing this, so many studies are coming out that, you know, people as they get to be my age and, you know, 50 and 60 and 70, um, having a meniscus tear in your knee, having bulging discs and flattened discs and spondylitis, all these different conditions, uh, rotator cuff tearing, labral tears, it's just as common as having wrinkles and gray hair. Sometimes they are the pain generator or the dysfunction generator for the person. Sometimes they're just happen to be found on there. And the classic one is you have know, somebody comes in and they have back pain and this and that and the pain's going down their right leg or their buttock and they get an MRI and they got a huge disc bulge, but it's on the other side. So it's been there all along and it's not even causing a problem over there. Sometimes it is, you know, when we treat accordingly, uh, but it's not always. So they did a really neat study and they showed that once you tell a person that they have a disc bulge on an MRI, their outcomes are worse. I don't know why, but a bulging disc, it's analogous to, I guess, pancreatic cancer, you know, because people come in and you know, you're working on them, you're getting them better, they still get that MRI and they come in and they're like, I got a bulging disc, and it's like, oh, because it's, it's creating a barrier that doesn't have to be there, and you got to go through the whole education thing. So I'm constantly just educating people, and sometimes it's just simple stuff. Um, men are famous for this. They come in, their shoulder hurts, and you say, well, how many times a day do you do something that hurts? Oh, you know, 15 or 20 times. Or, oh, God, God kills me every time I do this. I feel this thing click in here. And then you, you know, tell them, so I've hit my head against a brick wall, it hurts. But if I do it every day, my shoulder, it's always gonna hurt. So you, you constantly have to educate people, even for simple stuff. Just quit bugging your problem. Because it's amazing as to how many problems and people get better if they just quit bugging it. So my neighbor, we got new neighbors just moved in and he's got a meniscus tear and he's got a brace on and he said he's probably gonna come see me. And I said, in the meantime, just quit doing things that bother. Don't twist on it, don't squat, don't kneel all the way. Those things alone are gonna help most meniscus tears come around. And they just did a big study on meniscus tears that conservative treatment, PT, which again is a lot of just education to quit bothering, is just as effective as the people that have the surgery on it. So why have the surgery and then have to do therapy after when you can just do the therapy first and get it over short of having somebody cut pieces of your body out? Because I'm sure Dr. Mustn will admit, I mean, it's, it's that, that's, we're on the same wavelength there. We, we like to save people from surgery. Surgeons cut people, that's what they're trained to do. Uh, we're trained to try to get people fixed the natural way. Um, so as part of the education, uh, for years I used to have a, a website up that was, um, I started back in 2001. It's called ptupdate.com. It's for physical therapists and physicians because I got in the habit of reading a journal article every single day. And I thought, well, you know what? I'll read this. I'll critique them. I'll abstract it. I'll post it. So I end up with this huge website with movies on treatment and videos and links and everything. And it was pretty cool because it had people from all over the world participating uh, with it. And then as I had kids, I kind of backed off it. But now I use Facebook as the same vehicle. So we have a clinic page that if anybody uses Facebook, if you punch in John Duffy PT, you get my ugly mug and click like, and every day you'll get something on there, which today was just a, a simple article. They did a study showing that uh, the length of time people can add to their lives if they start exercising, and that it's never too late to start exercising. And the quality of those last years of your life that you've now prolonged are better because you are exercising. So I try to put up evidence-based material because that's what physical therapy is now. We've become a very evidence-based practice. Everything we're doing, uh, in the clinic, we can back it up with research and, and studies. And, you know, there's some things that I do that just work for me and I might not necessarily be able to back it up with a study, but I find that it does work for me. We try very hard and as this information comes out, I mean, I, I've been putting up a post every day 
I guess maybe about five years now. I've only missed a day or two. If I go on vacation, I stockpile them and I send them to my one girl and she posts them for me. Um, so I try to put that stuff up. And there's another website out there called getptfirst.com. And uh, a lot of people, it's, it's basically like a bunch of those things like you see on Facebook. It looks like a little billboard ad. And they'll have all those things on there about, you know, the opioid medications, just, just a whole bunch of evidence-based things. And it's a neat page to go through because as you, as you scroll down, it just keeps popping up with more of those boxes with little blurbs of information that I think everybody should know because it just improves your quality of life learning some of these things. It can take away anxiety. It can make you, oh, okay, well, maybe I should start doing that or stop doing that. Neat stuff. So that's my spiel.